So I want to talk about, uh, for a little bit, why it is that we struggle with finishing something. And I, in the last session I shared that the enemy fights at least 10 times harder over you finishing something rather than starting something because he understands creative dominion better than the church does. You know, one of the places I learned creative dominion, I was teaching in Romania. And uh, I had one off day, and they're like, we want to take you to this prison. I'm like, a prison? Like, I don't think off day means in your language what it means in my language, maybe. Um, and they took me to the Siget Memorial for the Victims of Communism. And still, I've been to, uh, you know, I've been to terrible places around the world. <laughs> it's, it's not so glorious or romantic. I've been to some horrible places. And it's like really visiting another one that's not very inspiring. And so we're walking through this prison, and, and I'm like, still, guys, why are we here? Like, I've been to Holocaust museums, and, you know, I've been to these terrible places. Why are we here? And finally, we arrive in this room, and there are these paintings on the wall. And these paintings were all kind of a reddish brown color, was the only color used. And they said, this is where Ceausescu rock, locked up all the artists, musicians, and poets, because he considered them the greatest threat to communism. And I, suddenly I knew I was here. And I, I found it fascinating that he, felt like the art, artistic people were the greatest threat to the ideals of, of communism. And, uh, and then uh, they, they took me over to these paintings. They say, you see these beautiful paintings? Yes. Um, they were made, the man had no paints. So he took one of the uh, piece of metal from the bed and he cut his arms and he took his own blood and the dust of the on the cell floor and made paint out of it and painted these with his fingernail. And there were these beautiful paintings on the wall that were made from blood and dust. And once again, I saw my Jesus. Yeah. That wow. the enemy was trying to put creativity under captivity. And the father took blood and dust and, and painted a picture of what he really looked like. Wow. And, but I also understood in that moment that, that uh, the enemy knows creative dominion better than we do. And so he doesn't war against you starting something. He wars against you finishing something. As a matter of fact, he loves it if you start lots of things and never finish. Uh, because then he can beat you up with guilt and shame and condemnation. And that actually makes his job easier. Uh, so I want to be at least as smart as the devil. Um, um, but let's look at a few of the reasons. First of all, the first reason we don't finish is our struggle with perfectionism. And we talked a little bit about this in the last session, but let's look specifically at the scripture now. Romans 1, 20 to 21. For since the creation of, of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal attributes, divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that people are without excuse. It goes right into this. For although they knew God through creation, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened, and they were given over to all manners of impurity. This has been the realm of creative people. Is uh, They've been linked with depression. They've been linked with darkness. And there's even this lie that your best art comes from the darkest places. Um, I don't know if you've ever believed that or heard that, yeah. um, but most people in artistic communities believe that. The reason they believe that is because when you get most vulnerable, you get most connected. Yeah. Like when you're hurting the worst, that's when you connect oftentimes with bigger issues, with things more important. But is it true as a principle? No, it's not. What happens is you actually kind of get closer to God in that moment, whether you know it or not, because you're vulnerable, because you're open. Because you're being real with your pain in that moment, but you can find that same place from a place of joy, and it's even greater because in his presence is fullness of joy. Mm -hmm. Pleasures at his right hand forevermore. Mm -hmm. But there's kind of this lie that that then your best art is going to come from the darkest place, your best song from the darkest place. No, 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 just learn how to get real without pain. Just 
learn how to get authentic without pain. Learn how to communicate in a real way rather than a religious way. As one of our brothers was telling me that he wrote country songs, I'm like, yes, go for it, man. Like, he's like, but they're not necessarily, you know, Christian song, worship song, you know? I'm like, yeah, awesome. I was teaching at the Bethel School of Worship two years ago, and I had this strange encounter. I was sharing one of my favorite quotes from uh, Blaise Pascal, who was a 17th century French economist and philosopher. And he said this, he said, it's not those that write the laws that have the greatest impact on any society, but those who write the songs. As soon as I said it, I went on preaching, but the Holy Spirit started speaking to me at the same time. And he said, yeah, that's how gay marriage passed in America. Right. And I, I said, what? Now, this is all happening while I'm still speaking. I'm carrying on two conversations at the same time. And I'm like, what? And he said, yeah, that's how gay marriages got passed. He said, because Christians don't write love songs, it was left for someone else to define love and family. Wow. And he said, um, Dan, what's the longest song in the Bible? I said, easy, Psalm 119. He said, wrong. He said, the longest song in the Bible is Song of Songs. It's a romantic song. And you use it for an allegory about Jesus, but it was written about a really hot chick. Yeah. You know? <laughs> And, uh, and it's not wrong to use it because all scripture points to Jesus. But we have to understand that right. Solomon, the wisest man in the world, wrote a romantic song, which is the longest song in the Bible. Right. And he said, Dan, I want you to commission people to write love songs, Christians to write love songs that don't mention my name, but carry my values, carry my virtues. That will make couples want to stay together. He said, this will never be one in the court system until it's first one through songs. And, um, and so people that are writing for Marketplace, please know that you have a primary place in the heart of God, not a secondary place in the heart of the economy of God. It's a huge, huge thing. So, um, so we have this principle of perfectionism that we battle. When you create from the divine nature, and everyone creates from the divine nature, whether they know Christ or not, they still are showing that their sons and daughters just lost sons and daughters yeah. by manifesting the creative nature. But the thing is, when you create something um, and, and you don't know that intuitively you're touching heaven, what you create looks really ugly in light yeah. of what you can see or sense or, or perceive out there in the realm. Why? Because every attribute of God is eternal. His love goes on forever and ever and ever. His mercy forever and ever and ever. His grace forever and ever and ever. You can never reach the end of it. The scripture says, the greatness of God no one can fathom. In Psalm uh, 145, I think, or 149. And, um, and so his greatness you can never reach the end of. So if we are truly creating out of his divine nature, what happens is you'll create something and in that creation, there was a connection with the divine that you did not perceive. So now you're looking at this thing that is finite compared to what is divine and eternal, and it seems like nothing. Mm -hmm. If you acknowledge what just happened, oh my goodness, I just touched heaven. You get sucked in to divine union. But if you refuse to acknowledge it or are ignorant of it, your foolish heart is darkened. And your thinking becomes futile. And you start having these crazy thoughts about what you created. This is terrible. This is junk. This is, ah, it's not good enough. And you battle with this perfectionism that actually is an invitation into communion with the divine. And I, I, I know um, the bass player um, for some famous rock band, I can't remember, uh, wrote a book called The Lost Glory. And he, he went over the subject. That's where I first heard it was from him. And uh, I began to apply it to my own life because it was so challenging. I wrestled. How many of you battle perfectionism? Like, uh, maybe not in every area, <laughs> you know, but in your art, in your expression of, of your art, your music, whatever, you battle perfectionism. I'm telling you, this is absolutely a key, is that if you see that that feeling, those thoughts are coming from an opportunity to connect with the eternal. That this only looks that bad in light of his goodness. 
all right? And then what you do is you just acknowledge the Lord, God, okay, this really feels like junk right now, but I know that that means I touched you, that I touched something eternal, and that's what I want to, that's what I want to experience right now. And you just, instead of getting pulled down that dark hole of creativity that we thought was creativity, the truth is you get sucked up into this divine union <coughs> of the creator himself. And then in an act of humility, you come back and you release this thing as something that connected me with this glory. Okay, so perfectionism is one of the things that we battle with and how do we fight it? God must be acknowledged in the creative act where it can literally lead to depression, futility, a dark heart, and all sorts of immorality. Because creativity is connecting you with the God nature and you can either acknowledge it or resist it. When we acknowledge God in any creative act, we are sucked up into divine union. But when we fail to acknowledge him, even as believers, or thank him, then we have still connected with something eternal and transcendent. And now we, what we've created never feels good enough. All right, so that's, that's the challenge of perfectionism. But can I just say that, you know, I, I'm not, I can't say I'm perfectly free of this, but I can tell you that this has like saved my life yeah. mm -hmm. and the ability to release things mm -hmm. and put them out there. And, um, and I wanna share not just a truth with you, I wanna share a piece of life with you. I, I wanna share a piece of breakthrough. I wanna share something meaningful with mm -hmm. you. Um, Cause my struggle, it was dark <laughs> with my creativity. It, it was dark. And this really gave me a context where now it's so sweet and it's so light and it's so light. So uh, maybe, I don't know, if the Lord's speaking strongly to you, why don't you just stand right where you are? I, I, wanna, I wanna release something over you. But if, if you feel like this is the key for your breakthrough in, in battle of perfectionism, you really battle this a lot and it's kept you from finishing. Just stand your feet real quick, and, and I just want to speak over you, okay? I want to release something over you. <laughs> so, Father, I pray that right now what took me years yeah. to kind of discover and master that our friends here could get in one moment by the grace of impartation. Whew, yeah. Father, I release a grace to connect with heaven in divine union. That in those moments of feeling so limited yeah. and so finite, we would realize that it's an invitation to the transcendent. It's an invitation yeah. to divine union and communion with yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, Father, I pray that where there has been depression and futility, there would be excitement and yeah. invitation. Yeah. Where there has been heaviness, there would be lightness, Father. Where there has been uh, futile thinking, there would be an acceleration of creative thought. Yep. And Father, where there has been immorality and impurity, there would be the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Lord, released over my friends. And so, Father, today we serve our perfectionism a death warrant. Mm. It's trying to serve us one. It's trying to serve us its dark meal, and we will eat of that table no more. We will eat of the table of the bread of life and the wine of our communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I thank you that that same power that set me free is here right now to set people free of their perfectionism. Lord God, that we could be just in that sweet place of divine union with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Bless you.